This is the Northwest Passage. It's a sea passage that spans 900 miles and joins the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans through the Arctic Archipelago. It may look insignificant, but the truth is, this passage has the potential to change everything. The only problem is that it doesn't exist yet. Well, sort of. You see, we've known about this passage for centuries, but it's always too covered in sea ice to be used for regular marine shipping during most of the year. But now this is all potentially changing. Since 1979, the Arctic sea ice has declined by 40%, with NASA saying it's currently disappearing at a rate of 13% per decade. Put simply, the Arctic sea ice is melting and also being replaced with thinner, seasonal ice due to climate change. And this means that eventually, whether it be by 2050, 2100, or somewhere in between, the Northwest Passage will become fully navigable for mega container ships for at least a few months out of the year. The importance and geopolitical ramifications of this cannot be understated. In fact, the reason we've known of this passage for centuries is because of how transformative it would be even back then. European explorers, beginning with Christopher Columbus in 1492, searched for a direct trade route from Western Europe to East Asia, but they never found one. It took until 1850 for the first icy northern passage to be discovered, or well, technically invented, and until 1906 when it was finally traversed by the legendary Raoul Amundsen. Since that first crossing, there have been at least 320 transits up until 2021, with 38 of them being from 2019 to 2021, showing it's still a pretty challenging passage to traverse, even today. But what makes it so important? Well, let's just look at a map. If you wanted to transport something from, say, Shanghai to New York, it would take about 10,500 nautical miles through the Panama Canal, which is currently the best and most convenient option for marine shipping from Asia to the US East Coast. However, that same journey through the Northwest Passage could be about 8,600 nautical miles, potentially saving seven days of travel time. It's the same with shipping from Japan to the US. From Yokohama port to New York City, the journey the journey is 25 days and about 9,720 nautical miles through the Panama Canal, whereas with the Northwest Passage, it would be 21 days and about 7,480 nautical miles. Basically, this passageway connects East Asia and America's East Coast far better than the Panama Canal, saving thousands of nautical miles in distance, time, fuel, and CO2 emissions, while even increasing the amount of cargo per transit by 25%, which is of course due to the Arctic route not being constrained by the same size and depth limits that the Panama Canal is. What I guess I'm trying to say is that this route can potentially cripple the Panama Canal, which I know sounds insane. The Panama Canal currently makes up 5% of total oceanic shipping, with around 30 to 14,000 ships carrying a combined $270 billion in cargo crossing it each year. But guys, there's a reason I've kept talking about the East Asia East Coast route, and that's because the canal is overwhelmingly dependent on the flow of trade between the US and China. Take a look at this graph. As of 2018, the US East Coast East Asia trade relations make up 36% of total tonnage passing through the Panama Canal, followed next by US East Coast South America West Coast at only 16%, less than half of that of East Asia East Coast. Now, that's a huge percentage dependence, and it's not even everything. Many trips from the US West Coast to Western Europe are shorter via the Northwest Passage as well, such as from the port of San Francisco to Rotterdam being about 7,000 nautical miles instead of 9,000 via the Panama Canal. So what we're looking at really are traffic losses of around 40% for the Panama Canal. Keep in mind too that Panama would not only be receiving significantly less shipping through the canal, but they'd most likely have to lower their toll prices as well in order for them to stay somewhat competitive, meaning even less money. Some experts say that due to how fast the ice is melting up north, the question isn't really if they're going to lose money, but rather how much they're going to lose. And this, of course, is terrible for the country of Panama given the canal and everything connected to it makes up 10% of their GDP, with it also being what Panama is famously known for. Yet, despite the possibility, it could be one of the biggest blows the Panamanian economy has ever been hit with. There's only been a handful of official government statements on the Arctic shipping lanes ever, and little to no coverage in the news about it. Could they be sleepwalking into a financial crisis? Well, maybe, but also maybe not. Obviously, their attention is focused more on immediate concerns rather than the distant impact of Arctic shipping. But the lack of attention could also be due to the confidence that their canal is simply superior to the alternatives, and will be for the foreseeable future. There's good reason to think that the Northwest Passage is not going to be taking over anytime soon. I mean, yeah, it's a waiting game that will take decades involving melting Arctic ice, but there's a lot more to it, such as significant infrastructure and geopolitical issues. Let me explain. 
The sheer scale of investment needed to transform the Northwest Passage into something fully capable of competing with the Panama Canal is a lot more complex than just letting the ice melt. It's not as though ships just sail straight through without stopping. Most maritime shipping uses something called the pendulum model, where ships make several stops on their journey to pick up and drop off cargo. This logistics chain requires markets, of which there are obviously none in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. And the problem is that it's extremely hard to build anything that far north. It's very remote and developing the region would be tough. Even with more of the ice melting out of the way, the area lacks natural harbors and infrastructure. Currently, in the Canadian north, where much of the Northwest Passage flows, there's only one developed deep water port, known as the Port of Churchill, located in Churchill, Manitoba. And it not only lacks rail connections to the rest of Canada, but melting permafrost puts both existing structures and future development on dangerous ground. This would be the case for anything developed there. Global warming might be taking away some of the Arctic ice's powers, but it's still highly unpredictable. Then there's the other problem, the geopolitical issues. Like I said before, countries which have rights to the world's most important shipping routes have been able to use it to their significant advantage. For example, Djibouti. This small country has become one of the most important countries in the world, largely because they possess one side of the territorial waters of the Bab al Mandeb, an entrance to the Red Sea and a gateway to the Suez Canal, which is one of the world's busiest shipping routes. I mean, there's a reason Djibouti has the most foreign military bases out of any country in Africa. The Northwest Passage is emerging as a similarly important area for countries trying to exert their influence. All of them knows its potential, they aren't stupid. Despite the fact that part of the Northwest Passage is pretty clearly in Canada's waters, or at least potentially enough to warrant controlling the waterways, some maritime nations, with America obviously being the loudest one, have denied that it belongs to Canada, claiming that it's an international strait because it connects two major bodies of water and should be able to be crossed freely by all NATO vessels, as it states in the Law of the Freedom of Navigation. Canada's argument is that the passage is part of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and therefore is their internal waters, making it's solely their waterway to control, as per the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Canadian House of Commons even unanimously voted in 2009 to rename the Northwest Passage to the Canadian Northwest Passage, to further stamp their ownership of it. They've previously said though, the passage would still be available for use, just under Canada's rules. This is pretty much being cemented too by them starting to build a new deep water port located in Kikitarjuak, Nunavut, near the entrance to the Northwest Passage. Another group that protests Canada's ownership of it actually comes from within the country itself, that is, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, who claim that the ice and water in the Northwest Passage belongs to the Inuit, who are indigenous people of northern Canada and parts of Greenland and Alaska. This is because the Northwest Passage is part of the Inuit Nunangat, their Arctic homeland for thousands of years. The ice is also important to their society because it allows more movement, as well as provides necessary resources to ensure their survival. Overall, the situation is pretty tense. Canada and America get along for the most part and share the longest undefended border in the world. But this passage issue has always been a controversial thorn in their relationship. Currently, there are no existing policies agreed upon nations that determine who can and cannot pass through the Northwest Passage. But with time, there surely will be. Will the US end up exerting its power and influence against Canada in order to secure their freedoms in the route? Maybe. But what do you think? Who does the Northwest Passage really belong to? And is it a threat to the Panama Canal? Thank you for watching.